Okay, so hi, I'm Linda Hutchinson, and on behalf of the News Access and Literacy Task Force of the League of Women Voters of Colorado, I would like to welcome you to Sunshine and Shadows, Balancing the Need for Public Awareness with Government Efficiency. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to make a couple of comments about the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters is nonpartisan. We do not endorse political parties or candidates, but we do take positions on political issues. And we arrive at those positions after grassroots study and consensus. Tonight's discussion is in the light of two of those positions. The first one is the League of Women Voters believes that government should be accountable, responsive, flexible, efficient, and effective. The League of Women Voters also believes that democratic government depends upon informed and active participation in government and requires that governmental bodies at all levels of government protect the citizens' right to know by giving adequate access, adequate notice of proposed actions, holding open meetings, and making public records accessible. So, Okay, so during the evening, if you or our discussion, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, you can raise your hand, hand using the hand icon, or you can type your question in the chat, or you can go like this, or you can just turn your mic on and speak. So our guest tonight is Jeff Roberts, Executive Director of the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition. Jeff worked in journalism as a reporter, assistant city editor and data journalism specialist for the Denver Post. And he is also the vice president of the National Freedom of Information Coalition. Jeff. Hi everybody. And actually as of uh, this week, I'm now the president of the National Freedom of Information oh, Coalition. Well, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I just have not updated my website on that. Yeah, I, um, that just happened. Um, uh, more, more, more stuff to do. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, the, the, the national organization supports uh, state organizations yeah, like ours. And... Uh, Answer radios. Yeah, here, hit whistles, etc. We will be monitoring you regularly to make sure you are in compliance. Somebody have Hi, a question? Hi, everybody. Can you uh, make sure that you're muted, please? Uh, um, thanks. Um, one thing about the questions, um, I do have some slides, <clears throat> and I may not be able to see the chat when the slides are are up. Um, so uh, it might be helpful to either have somebody looking at those and just um, ask me the questions, um, uh, or I can after the after I finish the slides, we can we can do some of that too. Um, so I just wanted to, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition, um, it is a five hundred one c three nonprofit, also nonpartisan, like the league. Um, the League is a member of CFOIC and was a founding member of it in 1987. Um, and our uh, role, our primary role, is to educate Coloradans and, and uh, the journalism community um, specifically, but all Coloradans, about their rights under the open government laws of Colorado. So those are the two public records laws. Uh, the open meetings law, which we'll talk about um, in a couple of minutes, um, and court access rules. And so um, we publish, um, and I'm going to share my screen here. Um, go to our homepage. ColoradoFOIC.org is the homepage if you've never been there. Um, and uh, it has a lot of information about um, all these topics. So um, one of the things that we do is publish an online guide to the Sunshine Laws in Colorado. Um, this is something we used to do in booklet form, but now do online and it's free to use. It's uh, indexed by topic. It links to the law, the case law. We update it when there's new laws, when there's uh, court rulings that, are, that affect uh, uh, the laws statewide. 
And um, this is a good resource for, for really anybody who wants to um, know about, about these laws. Um, we also uh, run a hotline. So if you have specific questions, you can email me or, or call me, and I'm happy to try to help with those. Um, and uh, we write. I write quite a bit about these issues. So the blog um, has about 600 articles on it, um, some of which have to do with the legislature, which we're going to talk about tonight. And we have a legislature page where you can see what we're following during a session. <clears throat> so we use a, a service called Bill Track 50 um, to keep track of, of the bills that we're following, which obviously have to do with freedom of information issues or, or press freedom or First Amendment types of things. Um, and you can see those here. And then also I write about these issues too. So uh, the blog uh, uh, will, it'll take you to blog articles that we've written, I've written about bills that are in the legislature. So, um, you know, explore that if you've, if you've never done that before, um, cause there's a lot on there and, and we, um, I, I update it almost every day. Um, so there's often new stuff there. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this and then go to, and I'll put that, um, I'm going to put that uh, website URL in the chat, coloradofoic.org. Um, and um, I do have some slides. So um, I'm going to start with those. Okay. Hopefully you can all see that. And... Is that, is that, can everybody see the slides? Linda, maybe not, or, yeah. Yes. Okay, thank yes. you, great. Um, so um, uh, I was asked in particular to discuss the, um, what they call quadratic voting in, in the legislature. And um, uh, I, I also saw that you had um, uh, Senator Chris Hansen as, as your speaker a month or so ago. Where he talked about it, I've I've watched his comments, um, and we obviously have different perspectives about about um, uh, how how we view uh, what they're doing. So um, Scott, who's who's on the call today or on the Zoom call, um, did last fall did a very good story um, where he examined this. Um, quadratic voting system that the legislature has been using for three or four years now and has been increasingly using it to help decide bills with fiscal notes, um, whether they end up living or dying during a session. So obviously these are bills that, that cost money. Um, they can't uh, fund everything in the state budget, so they have to make some decisions about that. And the caucuses, so the Democrats meet in one caucus, uh, in in each house, and the Republicans meet in their caucuses, and they they prioritize these things. But this system um, allows it. It's it's very clever. It allows them to do this um, anonymously and get a good sense from from uh, their caucuses of what they want to prioritize. Um, it's very efficient, um, and it gives them good information for that um for you know and and uh you know I listened to uh Senator Hansen's comments to you all about this and you know he called it um essentially a like you know getting feedback or sharing a draft and so in his mind you know this is not something that needed to be um, shared with the public. But um, we have issues with that uh, as far as transparency concerns. And we even wrote, um, after Scott did his story, and Scott interviewed me about it, um, CFOIC, we wrote a letter to legislative leaders uh, uh, expressing our concerns about this. 
And we never got a response to that letter, but we, we felt like we had to point out what we thought were the, the transparency violations that this was, um, this was doing. So it's a very efficient system that they've started, but we're wondering if um, uh, this could be done, you know, if in, in a more transparent way. So, uh, you know, Scott, Scott wrote about certain bills. Um, there was a bill to, um, I think it was to uh, expand the wildfire investigative team, and it would have cost $3 million a year, the sponsor of it. You know, the bill passed one house and just didn't get a hearing in the next house. The, the sponsor, you know, said it, she's, she was pretty sure that it was because of this system that killed her bill. But the public didn't doesn't really know how that transpired. Um, it sounds like they're going to use the system again. Scott did another story in January where they um, talked about using it again. Senator Hansen in his remarks to you uh, certainly seemed to imply that. And he uh, said that it is now being used by uh, three of four the four caucuses. So the Republicans and at least one of the House uh, how uh, chambers seem to be using this as well. Um, this is a, a link, or this is what our letter looked like. That's online. Um, but here are the here are the main points that we made about. Oops, trying to move this out of my way here. The snapshot here. So, um, uh, you know, we. We thought, and this isn't just me talking, um, our board president, Steve Zansberg, is the uh, main First Amendment media lawyer in the state, and he looked at this, and this was his conclusion as well. Um, and our board of directors um, uh, approved this letter. Um, we feel that the process that they're using violates both the letter and spirit of the open meetings law, which which uh, was passed 50 years ago by, by the citizens of Colorado um, this past November as part of the, the Sunshine Law. Um, and that law says that it's the policy of this state that the formation of public policy is public business and may not be conducted in secret. Senator Hansen in an interview called this a secret ballot. That was, those are his words. Um, so, a few things that we wanted to point out. Um, for one, these are essentially, you know, they're, these are tools being used by the caucuses and they're secret anonymous ballots being used by the caucuses. In 1983, um, the Colorado Supreme Court held that legislative caucus meetings are subject to the open meetings law. So, you are entitled to attend a legislative caucus meeting. How do you intend, how do you attend this legislative caucus meeting that's held by secret ballot? Um, you know, those caucus meetings uh, can be really important because uh, they help, especially with the party, those uh, held by the party in power, um, they can actually decide, you know, how, how the, legislature ends up voting on on these on these bills. Um, I was a state house reporter for the Denver Post in the 1980s and the early 1990s. And um, this was also pre Tabor. So the legislative caucus meetings, um, especially for the party in power were especially important back then because they could uh, not only fund bills, but they could raise taxes to do it. So um, I, I told Scott that I remembered a a uh, three week long uh, Republican Senate caucus meeting uh, that, you know, we, we went to every single day and we, we, we listened to every word of that. And we were allowed to do that because the Colorado Supreme Court had said a few years earlier that that, that was important for the public to be able to witness. So there's that, the open meetings law, specifically um, prohibits meetings among elected officials uh, via email or other electronic means. 
unless the public has an opportunity to observe the meeting as it transpires. Once again, this is a meeting in secret by secret ballot. How is the public supposed to attend that, watch that? Um, the open meetings law also exp expressly prohibits a public uh, body from using secret ballots to adopt a position. So here they're, you know, they're deciding essentially which, uh, or at least using that information to help them decide what bills go forward and what bills do not go forward. And, you know, it's the legislature themselves that put in that provision several years ago, barring the use of secret ballots by public bodies. So one, you know, another reason that we were concerned about this. And we felt like the public was entitled to know, you know, which, who specifically of their elected lawmakers favored or opposed these measures, uh, these votes with real bill killing consequences. So, um, you know, the other thing aspect about this is that KUNC put in a CORA request for these records and they were denied those records. So, in you know, in every way they're, they're um they're using the information it's it's um an efficient way of helping them make decisions but it's not a very transparent way of doing that so those were our concerns about quadratic voting jeff, do you guys want to talk about that now or or wait jeff this is kathy wilson and i'm monitoring the chat I'm one mm -hmm. of the people monitoring the chat um, for Linda and uh, Diana Greer asked, uh, does a, a failing vote in the caucus um, totally kill the bill? Well, so, you know, what the, what the Supreme Court had said about these caucus meetings is, is that they, they had a lot of influence on on what actually ends up happening once they go to the floor to vote or once they're in committee to vote. So they're making, they're effectively making decisions as a caucus, as a body that we're going to support this or, or not support that. So where, you know, it's, it's a little bit more of an informal way of doing it, but what they decide in those caucuses often affects uh, what actually happens to these bills. Okay, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering, um, before they used, how, how did they vote before they introduced the um, what is it, quadratic voting? And was it more transparent before they introduced quadratic voting? Uh, well, you know, I don't know if what they were doing like five, six years ago before they um, they started this particular system, if they had another way of doing that and we just never learned about it. Um, you know, I'm it's it's been a long time since I've been in a legislative caucus meeting. Like I said, I I covered those, but in the ones that I covered, uh, it was it was something where you could sit there and listen to them, listen to them discuss it, and you know you could see who was favoring one thing or another or making a case for one thing or another. It was an open process. Right. I think I heard uh, Senator Hansen said that before they used um, just priority voting instead of the quadratic voting where you you uh, give right. us more depth and and emphasis on what you want but you have they would just like one two three four your priorities yeah but it does and then i was wondering also um let's see how can i put this um if they they can use quadratic voting, but the the secrecy behind the votes isn't really a part of that method, right? The because he 
they like the quadratic voting because it gives them more of an idea of the depth to a to, of commitment to an issue, but they don't have, uh, I don't understand why they need to keep the poll, the survey secret, the results. I think that's a good question. Why, why, um, why did they consider it work product when they denied KUNC's CORA request for it? Right. Um, Steve oh. Mailers, I hope I'm I'm saying your last name correctly, asks: Are legislators just unaware about the Sunshine Laws and procedures, or is their intent to hide? They're not unaware of this because we've made it um, clear, um, at least from our letter, you know what our thought is about it. Um, so I think that they know um, what we're saying, but um, they don't view it as a violation. And and I don't, what I don't know is that they've gotten, you know, any kind of official analysis of that from their lawyers. Mm -hmm. Jeff has a question. Yes, well, I don't know if it's, I guess, a comment. I, th I think I remember hearing Chris saying um, that the one of the advantages that he thought they'd, they'd realized were, were that uh, they had much better turnout for voting, that people were not afraid to vote because people couldn't see how they voted. And I thought that was kind of an, I didn't realize that that was sort of a, a something to be desired <laughs> and that uh but i guess you know he thought it was a plus i know he thinks it's a plus i've never really seen um very many legislators who are shy about expressing how they feel about you know some measure or or, or another um and like I said, I understand how it's efficient and they do this anonymously. They could do it from home, uh, you know, and open their laptop and, and uh, you know, and, and, and see how they, you know, prioritize what they, what they favor. But, uh, you know, I think at the very least, uh, reporters should be able to, to do a CORA request for those results. Oh, oh. Maud, you had a question? Yeah. Um, thank you, Jeff. This is my third state legislature, but the first one that I've known where there was a, uh, where the caucuses, party caucuses were open to the public, um, which is a very interesting thing. It was always sausage um, in other places. Um, I One of the things I think I remember Chris Hansen saying is that is, is that it got away from leadership pressuring junior members um, and, and that that was a reason for keeping it anonymous that it gave actually more power to junior legislators because they could vote without, they, they could vote against mm -hmm. the Senate president's pet bill without fear of retribution. Did you see any evidence of junior legislators lining up behind leadership's bills um, more than they might otherwise, and, and, and not their own pet bills, um, when you were watching the caucuses in person? Way back when? <laughs> way back, um, way, way back machine. Absolutely. So, yeah, way back machine, a, a long, long, long time ago. Um, I don't, I don't actually uh, remember parsing it like that. Um, you know, I do remember the caucuses being pretty, pretty lively with a lot of discussion, um, uh, and uh, um, you know, this was a time back uh, when the other party controlled the legislature, um, the Republicans. Um, and and uh, you know they did have that that power to actually raise raise taxes back then as well. So there were some pretty interesting discussions, but I don't really recall um, 
you know, as far as, uh, you know, the, the necessarily the, the, the leadership dominating everything. And that's probably why, you know, I remember that one caucus that went on for three weeks because they couldn't get everybody in line. Diana asks, um, ha have they really been doing this for five or six years? Uh, well, I'm just going by what Scott reported and I think it was three, three to four. Okay. And I, I'm going to just kind of make a comment. I don't know if it's a question at all myself, but Maude and I were in a conversation back when this was first being um, reported. And um, one of our members uh, is, a, is a former legislator here from, from Colorado. And she said, but this is work product. This is work product. And they, um, they treat it as such. You have any comments about that? Sure. Um, the bills have been introduced. The bills are in the process. The bills are are being discussed uh, by committees. Um, they're there. Um, you know, there's there's an exception for work product if they're used in public meetings. Um, so you know, I you know the work product um, typically goes to bills that have not been introduced yet. Okay. Does this preclude conversation after they have um, uh, a quadratic vote? So, you know, that's an interesting aspect of the Sunshine Law um, because it technically says that a uh, meeting is two or more members of a state public body to discuss a uh, a, a bill or a, a, a you know a, an item of public business that they have um, policymaking responsibilities over. So does that mean two two members of a legislative committee, or does that mean any two members of the legislature? And I've I've actually asked Steve Zansberg that question. The my our CF, CFYC's board president, the lawyer um, who who really. Um, uh, I think is the is the the state's leading expert on this on this stuff, and you know he he reads the law as any two legislators. So, in practicality, though, you know is that is every every uh, conversation between every two legislators uh, a meeting under the open meetings law that anybody can attend? It's not necessarily a meeting that has to be noticed the way the notice requirement works in the open meetings law. But um, you know, you see all sorts of conversations happening at the state house, where uh, you know they're doing it offline. Now, I was I was in a committee hearing two weeks ago, and um, uh, they uh, were having trouble coming to agreement on an amendment, and they they took uh, the the whole committee, the whole Senate committee, went out of the room and went somewhere and talked about this and technically a reporter could follow them and because it's an open meeting but nobody did uh in that case you know reporters tend to pick their battles uh in in those cases because these things happen all the time um uh, and and um you know legislators get a lot of leeway as it is on things like that why don't we have one more question here and then you can continue. Um, Mark and Jory asked, um, why doesn't the, the Republican caucus object? Sounds like they're using it too. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. And and when they, you know, if if they ever get in, you know, back in a position of, uh, of power, they might want to use it too. Um, you know, and I should say that, you know, we don't know what a judge would think about this. No one has challenged it in court. And, um, you know, we have a, we have a, an opinion about it. Um, and they have their opinion about it. And we don't know, you know, if someone were to challenge this in court, how it would be viewed. Um, but, you know, and we may, we may ne never know that. All right, why don't you continue? 
I, I think that, you know, if they are going to continue to do this, they should figure out a way to make it more open. And, and one way to do that is to release the records about it. I'm not seeing any more questions. Linda, I don't know if you are. Well, um, I can go on if that's if that's um, what you'd like me to do. Um, so I was just going to talk about um, a handful of other things that are happening in the legislature um, this year related to freedom of information. Um, uh, again, you could go to the legislature page on our website and you can see what we're following. Uh, <clears throat> this um, what I'm going to talk about now is is related to a bill that hasn't been introduced yet, but that we're expecting. Um, so uh, the Colorado Open Records Act uh, is one of is one of two public records laws in Colorado. The other uh, pertains um, to criminal justice records. Bacora is the one that uh, you know you would use to get to get records about state and local government about anything that doesn't relate to police. Uh, or sheriff or things like that. And um, this is something that we've we've uh, tried to point out for several years now that the cost of obtaining public records can get very expensive. So the way the law works now, mm -hmm. it has since um, 2014, is that um, governments can charge an hourly rate for what's called research and retrieval. So pulling the records, um, assembling the records, redacting the records. Um, they can't charge for the first hour, but they can charge um, an hourly rate, which is uh, right now $33.58 times however many hours they say it's going to take to process your records request. And I hear in my job way too many stories of records requests costing hundreds or thousands of dollars. Um, because they multiply that 3358 times 10, 20, or 50 hours sometimes. And it makes essentially makes public records off limits. So I've focused a lot of that on this on, my, on our blog. We had a, a University of Denver law student do a report on this a few years ago. Um, and this rate in the law is tied to inflation. So July 1st, 2024, next year, it is going to go up again from 3358 probably north of $40 and that's because of what's been happening with inflation i asked um last summer i asked natalie mullis who's the head of uh, legislative council to calculate this rate for me you know as cuz inflation had, had been skyrocketing what's what's happening with this rate what do you see and um, that's what she came up with. And I wrote an article about it. And uh, inflation probably hasn't tempered uh, enough to, to really um, change that that much. So, you know, what I have been harping on is that it's just going to get more expensive. So I work um, with the Press Association and the Broadcasters Association. And they have been working with Senator Hansen again on a bill um, that will do multiple things, I think. But one of the things that we expect out of this bill, and this is these, I'm going to couch this by saying um, these are things that we have heard about in the bill. I don't know for sure that this is what this bill will contain. Um, we could get this bill introduced this week or next, uh, potentially. We, we um, you know, we hope it, it, it gets out pretty soon so we could, we could really take a close look at it and, and, and see, what, see what it does. But one of the elements um, could give a break on research and retrieval fees for the news media. Um, and the, the, the philosophy behind that is, of course, that uh, news organizations um, report on government for everyone's behalf. So, you know, being being able to do that without having to 
uh, think about a CORA request, co you know, costing hundreds or thousands of dollars, um, uh, makes it a little bit easier because, as we all know, it's it's uh, uh, the health of the news media isn't what it used to be. Um, so um, that's the philosophy there. Um, of course, there are issues with how do you define the news media, and there will be some sort of definition of that in this bill, and we'll see what people think about that. Um, as a trade-off to uh, that, uh, we expect that this bill will um, have longer deadlines for governments to respond to CORA requests. Right now, the law says um, three working days or less for records that aren't readily available. And um, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot you can do if they go longer than that, because people don't tend to sue over that. But um, governments um, complain quite a bit about uh, getting inundated with records requests, um, you know, by out-of-state entities, political actors, law firms, um, what they call data miners, um, and um, they want a little bit more time to be able to process those records requests. So we could see something. Uh, an extension in there for just ordinary members of the public. Now, I got to say that my organization, CFOIC, does not represent just the news media. I'm a former journalist, and we have, you know, we work very closely with the press and broadcasters associations. <clears throat> However, we also help the public. And I'm very concerned that the public gets charged uh, a lot of money for core requests. The public has to wait sometimes a long time. And so I uh, have made, tried to make the case that everyone should get a break um, on, on core requests, but I don't know that that's going to happen. It's a very difficult thing to argue for in the legislature. Um, the other thing that we might see in this bill is a little bit uh, stricter rules for the retention of emails. We had a DU law student do a study a few years ago um, on Colorado's very weak records retention law for emails. Um, they get deleted pretty quickly, and that can be a problem if you're trying to look into something. Um, this is a, a small thing that's actually a really, uh, would be a very welcome change. Uh, I don't know how many times I've heard from reporters and and other people who, who uh, are forced to write a check or even bring a check in person for public records. And um, you know, hopefully this bill, because this is what we've asked for, will, you know, if governments accept credit cards and electronic payments for other things, they should accept from them for core requests too. Um, and then there's another aspect of this that we expect in this bill um, that has to do with records of sexual harassment uh, uh, allegations against elected officials. Um, you may remember uh, we had a Denver school board member um, last year who was accused of sexual harassment. We've had other elected officials where this has happened. And in his case, there was an investigative report done and large portions of it were redacted. And the Denver Post and another newspaper sued over this or took actually got the uh, Denver Public Schools into court over this. And the judge ruled that the way Cora is worded now, there was nothing he could do about it. So uh, we feel, and I think others feel, that if an elected official is accused of sexual harassment or or worse, uh, then uh, you know this these um, reports should be disclosed to voters because the voters are 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 the you know the overseers of elected officials. So there should be more sunlight on on these types of reports. So that's what we're expecting. And once again, I don't know for sure that that's what this bill is going to contain. We'll find out soon. And of course, these things all change, you know, once they get introduced and they go through the process. 
Okay, um, Matt has a question. Jeff, sorry, another newish to Colorado question. Uh -huh. um, in the state where I was a bureaucrat, there was a, uh, a, a records retention committee subject to open meeting law. Um, not that many people showed up. It was a little like watching paint dry, but um, that set um, the records retention schedules for everything from Medicaid records to licensing board records to, I mean, just everything. Mm -hmm. um, there were hundreds of, of records retention schedules and it sounds like Colorado does not have a similar entity that it's all in statute. So um, the way it works here sad. is that um, many uh, governments will adopt the records retention schedules that the state archivist puts out. And, and um, when you look at those, uh, it is very specific to subject matter. Um, but when it comes to things like emails, um, there is a whole lot of discretion uh, that the sender or the, the, the person who, 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 has, who has their emails um, has in order to decide whether to keep those or not. Um, and so it is, it is pretty squishy about what they, they should be keeping or not. Um, the legislature's own policy on emails um, says that legislators should delete them after 30 days um, unless they, you know, deem them to be important for, you know, in one area or another. So they're the ones essentially deciding that they're supposed to consult uh, with the Office of Legislative Legal Services. But, but um, you know, we had a, a few years ago, we had a, a a state legislator who's, who's no, a state senator who's no longer in the legislature. He was pretty upset because he had made a records request for emails from someone of high ranking official in the state health department. And um, these were, you know, it was a, it was a recent request. So the, the emails should have existed, but, but the um, person had had uh, left state government, and their all of their emails were were deleted. So um, he was pretty upset about that, and and uh, you know that was one of the things that we looked at when we did, did this report. So we feel like it could be um, it could be a little stricter. The way the federal government tends to do it, they have something called the capstone method where at least in some agencies where the higher up you are in an agency, the more likely it is that your emails will be considered important. So they're, they have longer retention uh, schedules for that. It, it, would it be feasible to just have in this bill, the state archivist will do records retention schedules for emails and then let the um, archivist be thoughtful about it? Yeah, there Rather was than a, a statute. Um, the details, right? Statute. Right. Um, uh, there was a uh, Hanson was looking at this uh, last year as well, and a bill never got introduced. And one version of a bill that we saw, a proposed bill that we saw, did say something like that. Um, it was putting it all in the hands of the state archivist, and um, that didn't make it into this year's bill. So I don't know, know exactly if, if she didn't want that responsibility or, or not. Any other questions about a possible CORA bill? And, and you know, watch our, watch our website because I'll be writing about this as soon as it's introduced. And, and of course, we'll be following it and we'll testify about it and all those things. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go on to uh, another bill that we've been following. And actually I, I testified, uh, CFOIC supports this bill. Um, it's Senate Bill uh, 53, which um, has passed out passed one committee. And um, it's pretty simple. It, it basically says that that state and local governments shall not use non-disclosure agreements um, for uh, for their employees. So when they 
you know, when they um, uh, are hired or when they leave uh, government, um, they shouldn't be silenced. And so um, this comes, uh, Senator Kirk Meyer uh, is the sponsor of this. She had a similar bill about two years ago that didn't, didn't go anywhere. Uh, but this time the um, Denver Gazette did a big story about two, three months ago about state government's use of, of NDAs. And um, they found quite a bit of, 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 of use of that um, and, and reported on that. Um, and and uh, it's the use of it is growing uh, at the, in, in state government. So um, something that's kind of interesting about this, Senator Kirkmeyer is a Republican. Uh, she introduced this bill. She was the only sponsor of this bill. And so when we looked at it, when the Press Association looked at it, we were like, okay, well, this is a good idea, but it's not going to go anywhere because she doesn't have any Democratic sponsors on the bill. But um, it made it out of its first committee. So, uh, and it got Democratic votes. And and so we'll see what happens now. Um, it was supposed to come up last week um, and, and now it's delayed until um, a little bit later, maybe a week from now or so. Um, so I don't know what's going on behind the scenes with this bill, but um, it it seems like a good idea that you, you know, if, if a, uh, if a, public employee wants to talk about what's happening in state or local government, uh, they should be allowed to do that. I'm wondering, Maud and, and Jeff, if we're following, if the LAC is following this bill. So it's SB 53. Well, I've heard about it. That's all. I'm a up in discussions, so yeah. Uh, and once again, you could you know see all these bills on our on our page uh, and uh, see if if you if you like them or not. Hmm. Okay, Maude has a question. Uh, what happens when employees have information that should be cloaked, like child welfare workers? Yeah, there's there are there is a provision in this bill for th stuff like that. So, um, you know, and they and they even added an amendment I think that covers um, uh, th things like that 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 um, that for good, very good reasons should be cloaked. Um, we there's always not... you know as there's always a balance with these with with these laws and you know the same thing we talked about with quadratic voting you know there there are there are you know you weigh it you weigh it um you know full transparency on one side to maybe some need for for some secrecy on the other and uh, see where you end up all right Maude, did you want to say something else i i was just going to say um uh there the state league legislative action committee has not taken a pro or con or amend stance on um, 53. Um, and I don't think the, um, no, the local state and local government group has not, is not um, monitoring it either. Um, we operate a little bit the way the legislature does that we have issue specific committees that chew on bills pretty hard and then make a recommendation to the action committee as a whole. Um, but I think that would be the group that probably would have been tracking it. So um, another one that uh, we are supporting unless it gets changed dramatically, um, and is a bill that um, would make live streaming of criminal courtings the default. So this is something, uh, I wrote an article um, about this uh, about a month ago, 
uh, because the the uh, judicial branch is also working on a policy. It's this is really interesting. This is something they did not would not have ever anticipated before the pandemic, but COVID nineteen forced all the courts to go virtual um, and forced them to figure out how to do that. So many of them uh, now have court proceedings on WebEx. Um, and it was actually uh, for a while when everything was kind of shut down, it was it was somewhat, I mean, it wasn't universal because not every every court is equipped for that, but there was a lot of use about uh, of, of that. And now that things have eased, some judges are, aren't using it as much. So um, Representative Elizabeth Epps, um, who uh, uh, is very interested in um, in how criminal courts work in her in her job before the legislature um, as an activist, um, she you know she wants to see more eyes on on that, and so she has sponsored this bill. Um, uh, to to make it the default essentially and and as you can imagine, uh, journalists would like that, um, and so um, and and of course you know we we um, you know if anybody wants to watch how the courts work in Colorado, um, this is a way to do that. It's you know it, you can't always get into you know get to the courtroom to sit there and watch, but you can tune into something and watch, and sometimes it's 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 fascinating um and for a journalist it helps them do their job you know as uh you know journalists are are spread very thin these days and if they can cover something this way if they don't need to be in the courtroom um it really helps a lot it helps them cover more things and report on those things to the public so we're supportive of of this um uh, we had a meeting with representative epps today and um, there could be some amendments to this bill, so we'll see where where that goes. Um, but this is something that um, that we think is a good idea. Um, and meanwhile, the judicial branch is also working on a policy. They would prefer that they do it rather than having legislation dictate uh, what they should do. Um, and so they're working actually pretty quickly on that. I, I spoke for this article, I spoke to two judges who are chairing this, this committee that's doing this. And um, this could end up either, they have two ways of instituting policy in the judicial branch. One is by a directive of the Chief Justice of the, of the Colorado Supreme Court. And another one is a Supreme Court rule. Um, and if they do it that way, they collect, they do um, a lot of stakeholder um, input and things like that. Um, so we've got these parallel things going on now, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. Overall, it's a good, it's a good thing. Any questions about this one? All right. I, there is one. Linda, do you oh. want to take that in the chat? Yeah. Um, okay. So Steve sure. Mailers, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. What is the cost of 1182 for the technology and staffing technologies? Is there any obligation to archive the videos? Is it a new normal? Those are really good questions, and I don't know that we've seen a, maybe there is a fiscal note on that one out now. I should take a look at that because it was actually supposed to come up in a hearing today, and now it's it, and it didn't. So there might be a fiscal note on that. So we should take a look at that. But what the bill is saying though is it's only if they're already set up for this. So, um, you know, I I imagine that there is a cost on there. When I talked to the two judges about this, um, they were both very, you know, they were fans of, of live streaming uh, courts. Um, and they, you know, I could see if they make this re a, re a recommendation there, you know, to, to have this in, in courts statewide and, and make it more of the default that there will be a cost to that. Um, Cause not everybody's set up the same way to that. 
And there are other issues like archiving video that may not be something that they do um, for reporters um, and I, others. Um, there's an issue of, you know, shall, you know, are you allowed to record what you see on your laptop and put it on nine news, you know, that type of thing. And that's another thing. So that's called when you see cameras in the courtroom for big trials and things like that, um, that is always up to the judge. And uh, we have a, a, a name for that. It's called expanded media coverage. So before that ever happens, um, journalists have to ask the judge for permission. And essentially we see this uh, not changing. So if you are watching a, uh, a court proceeding on your laptop, um, it's still up to the judge whether you can record it and use that recording. Um, we've seen recently with the Club Q um, shooting case where they have had some orders that um, most of that has been live streamed um, so far. And I've seen, um, at least in, in one case, where they had an order where they allowed reporters to use that those images on, on uh, you know, in news stories and on TV and that type of thing. But that's up to the judge. Now, it's, a, it's not the easiest thing to enforce. Uh, they, you know, they could potentially cite you with a contempt of court if they catch you doing something like that. Um, but how do they catch you uh, is the question. Um, so there's interesting issues ar around this. Okay, so, um... Let's see. Kathy Mayer says there is a fiscal note and it says no appropriation is required. Maude gave the link to no appropriation required. And then Kathy says the fiscal note says this fiscal note assumes that courts are not required to expand their technological capabilities to add an additional plugin to their existing web conference platforms to allow for non-participatory viewing. If courts are required to purchase live streaming, it is estimated to cost $45 per hearing. Yeah, so Representative Epps um, has been careful about that because she didn't want to um, essentially doom the bill by putting a big fisc fiscal note on it. And um, so that's why I think she's she's um, framed this as as if the court is already set up for this, they you know this should be the default. Right. Sonia has a, a question that that refers back to pre, the previous, I believe, um, bill that you were talking about. She said, um, could an ex employee weaponize, um, like make a big deal? at the time of exit to cover up something else uh, going on in the legislature. I think that's the non-disclosure, right, Bill? Right. I guess, um, I'm, I'm not sure what that means, weaponize. Um, Sonia, do you want to? What are we, well, you know, I just had this idea trying to be a contrarian about why that maybe wouldn't be good people um, being able to speak out as soon as they leave a job, um, because with any job that, you know, there's sour grapes and everything, and it could maybe even be part of a strategy because they know what's going on at the Capitol. And if they come out and immediately uh, start conjuring up a big story to press, it could take some oxygen out of something else that the press should be looking at. Maybe it's remote, but I just wondered what the downside could be what's the worst case scenario of opening up that ability sure i mean you're talking to a former reporter so you know i would i would be in favor of of state employees being able to talk about about uh misconduct things like that that they've encountered is that what happened with the court administrator a few years ago you're right jeff yeah there were ndas um, Dave Magoya, who's the former colleague of mine, who's now at the Denver Gazette, uh, 
uh, is the one who broke a lot of those stories and NDAs made it harder for him to report on that. Hmm. Any um, other questions? So uh, let's see. Yeah, this is the last one I'm going to talk about um, that's been introduced. Um, and uh, it, it it's it's maybe not something that's that's up your alley as much, but it it's a freedom of information bill, and it it's um, you know it, it it may seem on the surface as one that makes perfect sense, and it it is li very likely going to pass. Um, we actually testified against it, and I felt really crappy doing that <laughs> um, because uh, it was a very unpopular opinion that we presented or that I presented, um, but I felt like it needed to be done. So this is a bill uh, that um, Senator Fields is running that uh, requires the deletion of, does somebody have their audio on? Yeah. Uh, excuse me, Jeff. Lynn, can you mute your your um never experienced your connection here? Because you're coming through to all of us. I realized something's not right. My body's not working right. I won't be able. Thank you. Thanks. Um. Anyway, uh, so this is a bill that requires the deletion of all juvenile victim and witness names from police records and court records before the release of the public. And you're probably thinking that's a good idea. And um, generally, I think it is a good idea. Um, but the way the law works now is they can already do this. So the law already under the Criminal Justice Records Act already gives records custodians the discretion to do this if they find that release would be contrary to the public interest. The reason this bill is being brought is that officials forgot to do this on a couple of occasions. And um, some names got released and some people got upset. And so now we have a bill. And um, what I pointed out in my testimony is that there are some situations where there is a public interest in, in having um, the, these names released, or at least um, to be able to get these records. And it should be decided on a case by case basis as it is now. So the thing that I don't understand fully about how this bill is going to work, if it becomes law, and I think it will, is um, you know, the the police kill a minor. Um, and uh, the reporter wants to get those records. Um, I'm not fully certain I understand how that's going to work um, under this bill. You know, I thought about Elijah McClain, who was 24, but what if he had been 17, you know, walking down the street and um, he ends up getting killed by police? And it took a long time, even at age 24, for reporters to be able to get a lot of records about his case. But, you know, sometimes you need those records to be able to hold police accountable. And I worry about that with this bill. And I think it should still be on a case by case basis, but it's probably not going to be after this after this bill passes. So I just felt like I needed to say something about that and make them think about that. So Maude has a comment. Sorry. Um, it sounds like the default now is that the names go out unless officials actively redact. It can be, yes. So, uh, you know, you could have, so what happened with uh, Senator Fields is that there was a shooting at Hinckley High School in Aurora a couple of years ago. And um, there were arrest affidavits that um, the, the, the kid, they were underage the, who are accused of doing this, but they were charged as adults. So. Once you're charged as adults, those records can be released. Arrest affidavits were were released to, to um, the Aurora Sentinel and some other news organizations. And uh, the court forgot to redact the names of some witnesses in there. Um, the Aurora Sentinel did not name those people in their story. They just linked to the arrest affidavit in a story. No one said anything for a year. 
And then Mayor Mike Kaufman uh, got really angry with them because somebody brought it to them somebody brought it to his attention. And once they were told about it, the newspaper took that down. Um, but nobody brought it to their attention for a year. And um, now we have a bill. What if it were the default that those were redacted, but on a case by case basis, they could be released? So the well, opposite, the opposite of what it is now. Yeah. So there was an amendment added, added to this bill uh, that allows someone, a news organization to go to court. But it's, it's a very high bar in order to show that the public interest outweighs this privacy interest. And news organizations, number one, would have to learn about the case. They would have to learn who it was. They would have to spend money to go to court. And you know, there's a process there. Um, that's probably what's gonna end up happening with this. So, you know, we'll have to live with it and see how, how it works. Thanks. Anyway, those are the bills that we are uh, looking at right now. Um, I imagine there will be more um, coming this session. And of course, we have that legislative legislative page that I've mentioned. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, now I'm seeing all the questions that are in here <laughs> <laughs> um, because I didn't see them before. But um, anything else you want to talk about? Any other questions from anyone? Okay. Let me unmute myself. And, and this is just a, an ignorance question, but since we have you, it'd be nice to know. Uh, in Colorado, how are public record notices conveyed to the public? Is there- a um, When you say public notices, you mean the ones that are printed in newspapers? Yes, is that required by law here in- Yes, yeah, so it depends on uh, the subject matter. And you know, so for instance, uh, this has been an issue in the legislature that the counties um, would love to um, no longer have to do that. Um, and um, I think they actually passed it there. The legislature actually passed a bill that uh, Hickenlooper vetoed uh, uh, that would have said that they no longer had to do this. Um, this is an issue that the Press Association feels strongly about. Um, you know, I imagine over time we'll probably have, they'll probably lose that battle. Um, but but um, so there are certain public notices that state law requires, but a lot of them are also um, at the municipal level as well. Um, you know, depending on what what it is, an ordinance that um, needs to be published before. Uh, before it's voted on or, you know, so that the public knows about it. Um, I spend part of the year in Florida, which is probably the worst case scenario about a lot of things. <laughs> and recently in our local paper, it came, don't be, let, don't be left out in the dark. And mm -hmm. it was talking about in our county, this is a Bavard County in Florida, is considered placing public notices only on their website instead of in the local newspapers. This limits your ability to see what the government is contemplating, imposing, uh, on, and of course, and it's hurting the newspapers by the same token, by placing all these on their own site instead of printing them and so forth, There, there's no safeguard of who's to, to say and so forth. But anyway, you know what the situation is, but it, you know, we are, we can really carry that everything to the nth in Florida. Oh yeah. So we had a, we had a really interesting case here in Colorado um, in what county is that? Custer County, I think it is. So Southern Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, there is a newspaper called the Wet Mountain Tribune, mm -hmm. and this other newspaper, which um, is very right wing and uh, doesn't really claim to be a traditional newspaper, but the county commissioners took the public notices and took them away from the Wet Mountain Tribune 
and gave them to this right wing site because they didn't like the Wet Mountain Tribune's coverage. And so um, the Wet Mountain Tribune sued and um, recently won a, won a settlement um, because it was retaliation essentially to, to, to make the other, this other thing, the paper of record. I think so that still means, that still means something. And of course, you know, for small newspapers, there's some revenue with that. So, you know, that's, that's an issue. I think Netherland was part of that, if I remember correctly. So what is that Summit County out there? Um, yeah, I think that might be a, there's another battle like this going on uh, too, uh, more recently. I think it also happened in Estes Park, didn't it? Something like that. There, so yeah, Estes Park actually had a had a, um, a referendum about that issue, public notices. There is a state website and that is run by the Press Association. In fact, this is in statute that requires the Press Association to have a website of public notices. So you can go, you can go to that and look at public notices. You know, and I don't know, you know, it, I don't know how many people still look at the public notices, but but it's it's a it's an issue for especially for smaller papers around the country. Okay, Steve has a question. I have a question about that. So in this day and age, if you talk about pushing information versus pulling it, right? So if, um, let's say that government organizations had a way that you could sign up for public notices, maybe it's just a global thing, or maybe you can say, I only want public notices related to whatever, right? And mm -hmm. there's technologies that can probably do that. That would seem to be more effective to me. And, and I know like in Fort Collins, there's a citizen thing that you can sign up for that'll tell you when there's certain things. Is there any movement towards that so that people can subscribe and say, hey, I wanna be, know, I wanna be told when this is happening rather than them having to look at newspapers or websites or other obscure places perhaps to find out if there is a meeting of something. I don't know the answer to that, but it's actually really similar to, um, the concept is similar to something that's in the open meetings law that was put in there in the original language in 1972, which are, they're known as sunshine lists. So if you want to be notified of a, you know, your county commission meeting or whatever, um, you you can actually ask to be put on one of these lists that's in the sunshine law yeah because another approach of course is the hundred citizens that care about something instead of them having to go find the information you rely on another organization to tell its members hey you all need to go check this out whether it's league of women voters or whatever but we're just un inundated with that. You know, the more organizations that you're a part of, you just get tremendous emails and, and everything else. So an individualized right. subscription might be better. So you should all know about a, um, a pilot project that's hopefully coming soon in Larimer County um, with the league and our organization and some other organizations that is going to uh, put more observers in public meetings. So um, that's an exciting project. And uh, um, we hope that that, that um, you know, just creates more information that's available for people, you know, especially uh, meetings that people can't get to. They're undercover, they're, you know, not, people don't pay much attention to them, but that's that's coming soon. I put in the chat a link to our, our open government guide, our Sunshine Laws guide, um, just to make sure that you all saw that when I was showing you that before, because um, you know that's a, a resource that, that we hope people use on a regular basis, in addition to you know checking with me if they want. Um, and I'm gonna put my email in here as well.
And um, if anybody is on social media and wants to follow us there, we're we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. I'll put our Twitter Twitter handle in here. And Jeff Withers, we should catch up sometime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, does anybody have any more questions for Jeff? Okay, well, don't forget that uh, March is it March 12th through the 18th is Sunshine Week. Mm -hmm. And does anybody have any announcements about anything going on in Sunshine Week, Jeff? So, um... I, starting tomorrow, we're going to start publicizing this, but we are going to be doing a panel on book banning. So um, that's going to be Thursday evening, March 16th. Um, we're doing it at Auraria, but we're also going to live stream it. So watch our, watch our emails, our Twitter feed, that type of thing. Oh, I should mention that if you want to sign up for CFOIC's newsletter, which is an email newsletter. I'll put that in here as well. Some of you I think are get that, but um, I, I only put those out every three or four weeks. Um, and, uh, but for also for special things like, you know, announcing a, an event or something like this, um, you can sign up for it there. Okay. Okay. Um, everybody ready to go? Okay. Um, thank you, Jeff. And so Thanks. remember the League of Women Voters believes in informed participation and you have been informed. So now you can go out and talk to your <laughs> congressman. Um, Thanks and sorry, I was incognito. I'm sorry, go ahead. I just said thanks for inviting me. Sure. And sorry, I was incognito during my introduction. I was reading my script and I couldn't see that I would, my face was not up there. So <laughs> it wasn't on purpose. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Yes.